going to tell you about the beginnings of an attempt to model emotions in the sigma cognitive architecture, starting with situational appraisal and its impact back on the system in terms of computational attention. So the roots of sigma as a cognitive architecture, based on four desiderata, many of you have seen three of these before, there's one been added recently. These are the four things we're trying to do with sigma as we're building this new cognitive architecture. So grand unified means both um, combining the traditional symbolic aspects with all the sub-symbolic aspects required for complete intelligent behavior. So perception motor, effective, attentive, and so on. Generically cognitive, this is the new one in terms of explicitly being listed, spanning both natural and artificial cognition, trying to learn from both and be able to model both. Functionally elegant, roughly it says you want to produce the broad set of capabilities from the interactions among a small general set of mechanisms, something sometimes called uh, cognitive Newton's laws. And sufficiently efficient, not necessarily optimal, but runs fast enough for uh, behaving in real time, for example. The approach we're taking is based on the graphical architecture hypothesis that the key at this point is combining what we've learned in the field from over 30 years of separate work in cognitive architectures and graphical models. So that's the approach that's being taken. As a system, Sigma is structured in layers, um, in analogy to computer systems. So in a computer system, you might have hardware, uh, microcode or firmware, a computer architecture, programs and services on top of that. You can, of course, elaborate on these layers more, but that's basics. Sigma cognitive system looks like LISP, graphical architecture, cognitive architecture, knowledge and skills. The cognitive architecture roughly maps onto the computer architecture, providing the basic level of programmability. It's constructed out of three basic concepts, predicates and conditionals, that are the representation language that I won't say much about, a nested tri-level uh, control structure, and a processing loop which is intended to, to map onto the 50 millisecond cognitive cycle in people. It starts with input, then you elaborate on, on what you know, then you adapt based on that, and then output. In a little more detail, elaboration combines memory access, perception, and reasoning. Most of perception happens in here rather than here. This is just transduction. Adaptation includes decision-making, learning, uh, tension, affect, all of the things that are going to, going to modify how the system behaves. Below that, though, is the graphical architecture, which roughly maps onto microcode or firmware layer. So it provides a lower level of programmability between the hardware and the regular architecture, and it serves to implement the level above. So the graphical architecture is based on notions of graphical models, piecewise linear functions, and gradient descent learning. It has a cycle which includes just solving the graphs and modifying the graphs. So it's quite simple at this level. What's important, though, is that all of elaboration maps onto graph solution, and all of adaptation maps onto graph modification. So this is the way we take this simpler system and implement this somewhat more complex systems and then it gets more complex as you get up to knowledge and skills. Now, we heard the talk from Jurgen this morning, which focused very much at a graphical layer. He didn't use graphical models, he used uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, they're very similar methodologies, and in fact, there are recent papers that map deep learning onto graphical models, yielding some very interesting results. Right now, I'm placing my bets that in fact, in the long term, graphical models are gonna lead to a more fundamental understanding, and in fact, a better approach in the long term than the kind of RNNs that we're seeing. That's not the case right now, but in the long term, I'm hypothesizing that that will happen. Um, the other thing you didn't see in that talk is the higher level. He talks about building a world model and, and the perceptual motor stuff, which adds a little bit of structure on top of just the graphs. But the hypothesis is there's much more that needs to be done at the graphical, at the cognitive architectural level that you don't see if you just focus purely on the graphs. So we've got these two levels and an interaction between them that's critical here. Now, in order to understand the work on emotion, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about these components. I'm gonna ignore those. So the cognitive architecture I wanna talk about is this tri-level nested control structure. And this is very much taken from SOAR. The inner loop is a parallel reactive layer, essentially a single graph cognitive cycle conceptualized like that. The important thing though is that that's not a separate module. It's the inner loop then of a serial or iterative deliberative layer where you repeatedly select and apply operators. This is how you get sequential behavior happening, with each step involving reactivity, both internally and externally. 
That acts as the inner loop then for a recursive reflective layer, which does a form of what calls impasse-driven meta-level processing. Not going into the details here, but this is where you step back and think about your behavior, as opposed to just algorithmic behavior or reactive behavior. This roughly maps onto a number of distinctions and ways of thinking about things in cognitive psychology, robotics, emotion modeling. I think they're all basically the same hierarchy. They're just talked about in different ways because of the different perspective people come from. They all roughly map into something like this. Now, if we look at the graphical architecture, graphical models are one particular form of graphical processing. They're not just graph theory. They're not quite neural nets, though a number of them map onto them. There are specific mathematical formalism that looks at efficient processing with complex multivariable functions by leveraging forms of independence to decompose them into products of simpler functions, map those onto graphs, and then solve them typically via some kind of message passing or a sampling algorithm or one of several other classes of approaches. So Bayesian networks are used for decomposing probabilistic functions. Factor graphs let you decompose arbitrary multivariate functions. Uh, we have both variable nodes and little factor nodes where you store functions. Now, from an architectural perspective, this is particularly interesting because you get a broad capability from uniform base. You can get state-of-the-art performance across symbols, probabilities, and signals, all from factor graphs and one form of message passing called the summary product algorithm. So again, that's part of this functionally elegant story we're trying to tell. Piecewise linear functions are used for the, the factor functions and messages. At the base, they're continuous, just a whole bunch of piecewise linear, I mean, a bunch of, of linear functions. Uh, but you can specialize them to get discrete functions and to get symbolic functions. So we get some of the broad spectrum capability from that. Gradient descent learning, then, is learning at these factor functions based on the messages coming back in them. Essentially, the messages out of them drive behavior, messages into them drive learning. Ends up with something like backprop, but it's not quite the same. So that's what's going on down in the graphical architecture. So let's now shift to emotions in Sigma. So the initial exploration is driven by a combination of, of motivations. One is the combination of grand unification and generic cognition which both say we've got to add all these capabilities that are in people and that we think we're going to need in artificial systems. In combination with the practical goal of building useful virtual humans, like this guy here who is in a Navy counseling setting. The issue is if you, don't have, if you build virtual humans and don't have emotions, you're very much in uncanny valley. And it not only makes it uncomfortable, it reduces the quality of the training that you get out of these things. So you absolutely have to have emotions. And also their general hypothesis that emotion is critical for surviving and thriving in complex physical and social environments. It's not just a metaphenomena, it's absolutely central. I call it part of the wisdom of evolution. It's what we're forced to do by evolution because it knows what's good for us, whether it's correct or not. It's, at least the assumption is it's largely non-voluntary and immutable. Um, so there's likely a significant architectural component, although it's clearly affected by knowledge and skills. There's low-level emotions, high-level emotions, gets back into that hierarchy. Here we're going to focus more on the low-level aspects, which are grounded in the architecture. So here's the rough picture. We have the architecture. We have a notion of appraisal, which I'll talk about a little more shortly, which is monitoring the architecture and generating variables, which ultimately contribute to the emotional state, which then goes back in some sort of modulation to modify the architecture in the same way that will change how you think and behave. So there's a full loop here. If all you're doing is appraisal, you have no benefits of emotions. If all you're doing is this, you don't know how to get there. You have to have the full arc. So in particular, in this work, we looked at two appraisals, expectedness and desirability, and we looked at their impact on certain aspects of attention. Okay, appraisal. It's typically considered the first phase of emotion processing in most modern theories of emotion. Essentially, you're sensing emotionally relevant aspects of the state of the system. At the lowest level, you can think of it as architectural proprioception. It's the architecture sensing itself, sensing properties of itself that are going to matter for how it controls its behavior. There are many different theories about appraisals. Uh, the Emma theory, which we've been looking at because John Gratch is a co-author, uh, and it seems to be one of the better theories, has seven different appraisal variables. There's work by Scherer and others that have 20 or more variables. Whichever approach you get, you'll see a lot of overlap between these, but they specialize them in different ways. 
In the initial work in Sigma, we're focusing on two of these appraisal variables. Expectedness, that is the extent an event is predicted by past knowledge, and desirability, the extent an event facilitates what you want, what your goals are, what your rewards provide, and so on. So let's look at these two, unexpected, expectedness in the form of unexpectedness. Here we're building on Laurent E.T.'s Bayesian theory of surprise. The basic notion is if you have a model that's predicting things and you have some new data, how much do you have to modify that model to accommodate the new data? The more you have to modify it, the bigger the surprise that data is with respect to the model. So what his theory does is it looks at the prior and posterior distributions and says the bigger the difference, the more the surprise. It uses Bayesian belief updating to do the learning, to go between the prior and the posterior, and it uses KL divergence as a means of comparing those two distributions to figure out how much surprise you have. And he's got work going all the way from the neuroscience up to psychology and, and practical systems showing the benefits of this kind of an approach. In Sigma, we're focusing on unexpectedness here, but we're using gradient descent learning, what we already have in Sigma, instead of adding something new, in order to learn the distribution and something called Hellinger distance, as opposed to KL divergence, to compare them. The primary reason is the KL divergence can't handle zeros in the model, whereas Hellinger can. It's also symmetric, which is nice, but it doesn't matter that much. So same general idea, but a different learning mechanism and a different comparison metric. So suppose we have a visual image here that you're looking at for a little while, so you build up a model of it, a model of what's going on in the environment. In this case, it's a static model. Then part of it changes. This lower left corner goes from blue to green. You should be surprised to some extent because that violates your model. So we have, using this, we're able to compute a surprise map which compares at every point the data, or actually the posterior given the data, to the model, that is what you thought the world was like before you saw the data. And you probably can't see these numbers, but the highest number by far is down here in the lower left corner. So this is a map of your surprise over the visual image for this particular time point. Let's go on to desirability. Here, what we're looking at is how close is our current situation to our goal? And again, we're gonna have a distribution over the state, a distribution over the goal. We're gonna use the Hellinger difference to compare those and get some notion of distance to the goal. And we can actually use the Bhattacharya coefficient, which is this inner portion of the Hellinger difference to give us similarity or progress towards the goal. So we get both out of a single measure, essentially. So suppose we're doing visual search. Here we have that same image. Now we're looking for yellow. So we have a goal of yellow everywhere in the image. Um, that should pick out those two pieces, which with a progress map up here and a difference map there, you can see 0.5 is there, zero everywhere else, zero here, non-zero in the other parts. You can do the same thing in the eight puzzle, the state and the goal, where you've got a progress map which shows you basically the, the tiles in place and a difference map where um, which actually highlights down here the non-zero parts, the parts that aren't in place. So you can imagine using this in controlling search at the deliberative level, and we show that on the paper, but that's not what we're focusing on here. What I want to focus on is attention at the reactive level. Now, in general, attention is effective, limit effective allocation of limited resources. And it is an issue at all levels. We're going to focus on reactive here, uh, we did a little on deliberative. There is also interesting work can be done on attention to the reflective layer. When do you impasse? When do you reflect? What do you reflect on? Those are all attentional issues there. Here it's standard control of search. Here it's a much more level thing having to do with the messages in reactivity. In attention, typically you see both bottom-up and top-down effects. Bottom-up are based on the data. Top-down are based on your goals. We can base the bottom-up aspect on unexpectedness. The notion is your attention should be drawn to things in the environment which are unexpected. And that applies both to perceptual attention as well as things internally. We are modeling top-down or goal-driven based on desirability because it gives you a, a specific notion of how close you are or what parts of the current state match or don't match the goal. So we can get the bottom-up and the top-down effect. So if we have our visual field, we have the change, so we have surprise there and we have goal-directed there. We get a surprise map and a progress map. We can then combine them. There are multiple ways of thinking of doing this. We do that here by a form of probabilistic OR uh, that assumes independence. 
uh, because we don't have the, the other way of computing it. That then in this attention map highlights both the place that has changed and the parts that match our goal. The key thing then is how that affects your behavior. Uh, I can't go into the details here, but the rough thing we're doing is saying we're abstracting messages based on attentional allocation. So we had a bunch of things over here which required attention, and so we keep our discriminations there. We actually reduce the amount of discrimination in this part where there's nothing we care about. So this is blue, that's red. This is some um, bimodal distribution of the two. And in fact, in the extreme, we were showed that you could, in fact, reduce a message from 160,000 regions to 12 regions, where it just focused on the portion of the message that mattered based both on the external world, that is your surprise, and desirability. So that's the rough idea how this reactive attention mechanism goes. We showed this in SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping too. Showed you could still get to the same answers doing this kind of attention. This is how this fits into SOAR, Sigma overall. Sorry, I still slip uh, since I worked on SOAR for 15 years. Um, memory problem solving learning. You can see there are many kinds of capabilities we've worked on. Got attention listed as part of affect there. So conclusion. So this is the beginnings of a full model of emotion. It's a, far, a long way from a full model of emotion. But it does talk about two appraisals and their impact on computational attention. Uh, a fair amount of reactive, a little bit on deliberative. A lot of more work to get to that full model, more appraisal variables and aggregation across them to get global um, emotional variables. Um, more of the kinds of impacts on thought and behavior many different aspects, coping behaviors, moods, drives, motivations, the relationship to embodiment, and the variables driven by the system itself, uh, and aspects of reflective control. Thank you.